welcome everyone to In Dreams Awake. Thank you for joining us uh, across time zones today for this conversation between Suzanne Lee, Cathy Rutenberg, and Jamea Richmond Edwards. There is a uh, closed captioning in English available by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of the screen. Also, today's program is being recorded, so uh, it will be available online in the coming weeks. My name is Mathilde walker -Bio. I'm creator of programming at the American Folk Art Museum. And I want to start by acknowledging that our museum stands upon Lenape Hawking, the unceded traditional homelands of the Lenape Illawar peoples. We honor Lenape people, past, present, and future, and are committed to centering indigenous perspectives in exhibitions and programs at the museum. As many of you know, um, FM is dedicated to uplifting the work of self-taught artists. And we are thrilled uh, to celebrate the life and work of Maurice Hirschfeld with our current exhibition, Maurice Hirschfeld Rediscovered, which is on view uh, now uh, at Tulicon Square until January 29, 2023. So today, um, we are so pleased to be joined by three incredible artists, Suzanne B, Jamea Richmond Edwards, and Kathy Rotenberg for a conversation focusing on Hirschfeld's uh, visual imagination and fantasy. The title of this program, In Dreams Awake, is a direct reference to uh, a site-specific installation by one of our speakers, Kathy Rutenberg. It was installed on Broadway in 2017. And the artist stated that the sculpture um, enabled the viewers to escape from New York's urban intensity with dreamlike fables. Ornamental, playful, and sensual, Maurice Hirschfeld's painting also offered um, his public and his audience moments of escape from the harsh realities of the 30s and 40s uh, in New York and beyond. So our aim today is to really look closely at Hirschfeld's departure from realism. Also, in Dreams Awake refers to a state of awareness and alertness while asleep. So that's something we'd like to explore with our speakers tonight, as we will appreciate Maurice Hirschfeld's visual imagination critically, shedding a feminist eye on his disarming portraits of women. This program will begin uh, with uh, a short introduction by our moderator, Issa Segalovic, um, and will be followed by individual presentation by our speakers and followed by a conversation with everyone. There will be time for questions, so please um, share your questions throughout the talks using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. I'd like to thank our IT director, Richard Ho, for technical support today, and to all of you for being here. We're grateful for uh, opportunities to connect online, and uh, that would not be possible without the National Endowment for Humanities and also all of you. So thank you for being here. So now I'll turn it over to Isa Segalovic, uh, a Philadelphia-based artist, designer, writer, and TikToker. She's a contributing writer upper allergic and adjunct professor at the King University School of Interior Design. So thank you again, everyone, for being here. And please welcome Isa. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and I'm so happy to be here showing at um, talking uh, and moderating with you guys at the uh, American Folk Art Museum. And also I'm so happy that this artist is being celebrated and is being on display. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of background on who uh, Morris Hirschfeld was and what made him so unique in the world of modern art. Here is a gallery view of the, uh, of the installation. If you haven't checked it out, of course, please go and check it out. It's a beautiful show. Um, and you can see some of his incredibly, uh, incredibly strong, incredibly graphic and colorful paintings. Um, he's an incredibly unique in that he is, as they say at the Getty Museum, is considered one of the most critically acclaimed self-taught artists of the 20th century. And another thing that makes him very unique is that he was a Polish-American Jewish painter and immigrated from uh, from Poland as um, as an Ashkenazi Jew. He um, he came here in, at 18 years old and be became a part of the textile industry. 
where he worked at a woman's coat factory. And like many, this is something that's very common for many, many of us um, that have Jewish ancestors that came into New York. My own grandparents, uh, great grandparents worked in textile factories. Um, but he also was a businessman. He founded his own business with his brother, um, where he first manufactured women's coats and then uh, with these women's shoes, where he actually patented his own design. And as you can see, they're really, really beautiful, really inventive shoes that I know I would wear today if I had the option to buy them somewhere. Um, and you're going to see in a lot of his paintings, this ornamentality, this, uh, this sense of textiles come up in his work in a very, very, very strong way. Another thing that you're going to see is themes of, of Judaism that will come up later as well. He So that ornamentality comes from his background in textiles, his background in fashion, but it's also a little bit of his background in Jewish ritual art as well. This is a, um, a Jewish paper cut uh, or is uh, this particular type of paper cut is called a misra that would be hung in your home uh, that is from Poland that's where he is from as well um, from the late 1800s and these used to be really really common in Jewish homes some uh, some Jewish couples still have them today in the ketuba or the marriage contract but um, but what these used to be kind of all over and you would have them for many different times of the year. Some of them were done by anybody. They could be self-taught artists and some of them were done by professional artists. So one of the things that becomes really complicated in Jewish art is actually the question of, is it folk art? Is it self-taught art? And when is that kind of uh, a label that's thrown onto uh, someone's uh, ethnic piece of, piece of art? And so one of the, um, and so the, but as you can see anyway, one of the most important parts here is that they are very densely ornamental and also very colorful. And so, well, you know, actually his origins in, we, we often talk about him as beginning painting far later in life after he had retired and after his failing health um, made him have to close his business. But he also actually paint, uh, created wood carvings for his local synagogue uh, at home in Poland at the age of uh, 14. And so he actually started as creating uh, creating wooden carved groggers, which is a noisemaker that is used during Purim. But he also created this very large um, six foot wood carving of two lions on either side of a decalogue that would be used in um in the in the synagogue when he was 14 years old uh which was it just very young um to create such kind of like a masterful piece of work unfortunately that is lost but um but richard meyer has kind of drawn out in the catalog how those scout those sculptural you can kind of you can pull out those sculptural elements uh from these pieces in his works of women as well as especially when they're uh when the noses and the feet start to stand out a little bit from the canvas and so you can see that that's a very common another very common um motif that is in jewish ritual art but there's also which is the lions on either side of the decalogue but this is also a very long tradition of secular paintings this is all this is a secular painting and one of the reasons you can tell is the is the human figures inside and as you can see here, these are all human figures of men. There were women that were painted too in Jewish secular folk art, but one of the things that you won't see and, um, until you get to Morris Hirschfeld is pictures of, uh, of women without their clothing. So this is something that makes Morris Hirschfeld incredibly unique is that he is a, um, an observant Jewish artist that also creates these uh, portraits of women who are in the nude. And so we, um, this is going to be a really, a really interesting thing to talk about. And one of the things that we're going to explore today is how he, uh, what do these paintings tell us? And what do they tell us about that time? What do they tell us about the artist? So these paintings, even though people had seen women nude paintings in Western art tradition for hundreds of years, there was something about these his paintings of nude women that kind of shocked people and scandalized people. And so we want to like sort of explore and unpack what that means. What was his relationship to women? So one of the interesting things is that he was continued to be an observant Jew and um, and wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't have nude models come to his studio. Instead, he was working from his own, um, from his own 
uh, mannequins that he would that he used to use when he was creating coats. So that's one of the reasons that you'll see the kind of mannequin figures. But I'm going to pass this off to the artists who are going to talk about their work in relationship to Morris Hirschfeld's work, what makes them similar, different, all of these things. Um, and so first, we're going to start with uh, with Susan, painter Susan B, who is an artist and editor living in Brooklyn, who creates powerful images of women, often in these very surreal and mythological settings, um, exploring internal and personal darkness where demons are even sometimes friends. Um, and so this is actually a Morris uh, Hirschfield picture, but you'll see um, you'll see Susan's uh, paintings in, in just a moment when she uh, when she compares them. So take it away, Susan. Uh, thank you so much um, for that intro, and it's really fascinating to be talking about Morris Hirschfeld. Um, I saw, I loved seeing the paintings in person. I recommend anybody who can get to New York should go to the museum and see the paintings. Um, it's very interesting that the artist claimed that his paintings were better than a camera could do and um, more true to reality. Um, and I, I actually identify with his claim um, my paintings, as well as Hirschfeld's, correspond to my internal vision of the world rather than an objective capture of it. And like Hirschfeld, I do not privilege physical reality over pictorial imagination. But I do like the, uh, I love the act of painting and I want colors and textures in my mostly oil paintings to create a pleasurable visual world for my viewers. And one of the things I love about Hirschfeld is his stylized and decorative approach to image making, which you can see in this girl with the Angora clap. And I understood why the Surrealists also appreciated his work. Um, his work is suspended between nature and mysticism, between reality and magic. And it takes place in a sort of fantasy, um, a, a spot of fantasy and mythology. Um, and I think that the title of this panel, Dreams, um, has a lot to do with his imagery. And it's also the place where my artwork comes from. Um, I also come from Jewish immigrant parents. And in fact, one of my grandparents was the tailor in Berlin and in Palestine. And another great grandparent was a Torah scribe. Um, my parents were also both commercial and fine artists. So I can I really identify with Hirschfeld's background. Also, I work commercially as a graphic designer and editor while pursuing my art. And so I feel like my you know, background in design, much like his background as a shoemaker or a designer of shoes rather than a shoemaker, um, you know, gives us a way to appreciate the graphic quality of his paintings, even the sandals in this in this painting are really wild and nice. Um, so um, next, um, next slide. So this is my painting, <laughs> which I found had this strange affinity with his painting. And even though I'm a professionally trained artist, I feel a great affiliation with um, outsider and folk artists. And I, I prefer their more straightforward and naive approach to figuration. Um, I like the way Hirschfeld's women, men, animals, landscapes seem to be made up of a lot of different parts, which is also the way I put together my paintings. And um, so I can identify with his creations. And I love his use of Jewish motifs, which I'll show later. Um, so I, I also want to comment that I find his images of women um, very appealing and not particularly erotic. Um, it's unlike the work of many of the surrealist men, um, his work does not seem exploitive at all. Um, I think it's more chaste actually. Um, and it's interesting that his women seem to have um, their own space and their own, I feel like they're being treated with respect. Um, and in my painting, I found an interesting comparison. And we were both using patterns to map out space and uh, in a decorative and also meaningful way. So the spotted cat in my painting is sort of the logical center of the painting. 
um, which I actually added at the last minute when I sort of finished the painting and then I thought, hmm, it needs something in the center. <laughs> Although it had so much stuff in already, you would have thought it didn't really need anything in the center. But um, I've been really inspired by artists like Chagall also who drew on folk art and also medieval artists and their use of flat space and illuminated lines is very inspirational for me. So next. Um, and also, this is one of his Jewish pieces, Moses and Aaron, of delicious recoil, which I find absolutely charming. And um, I've been very interested in bypassing the realm of realistic figuration for sort of fantasy dreamlike spaces and gods and goddesses and masks. And as I'll show you some uh, dragons and witches and saints and creatures with um, wings and hearts. Um, next. So this is my uh, painting, Jacob's Ladder, which um, I feel has a lot of uh, lot in common with his painting in the sense it's also a secular Jewish painting. It's based on a page from the Kabbalah, which is a 16th century mystical um, text. And I, it's based on a black and white woodcut. And here I've kind of made, you know, changed it quite a bit in the sense that I've colorized it and made it into an oil painting. But it also, I want to have the feeling of a dream and an imaginary heavenly space. So I think by adding color to a black and white image, of course, um, and to a biblical image, um, I get a different effect. Um, next. So this is my painting, Demonology, from 2018. Um, and it's inspired by a black and white woodcut by James Enzor. And um, here I've reconfigured the composition to include a sort of self-portrait. Um, changing, and I find it interesting to change as a feminist artist, to change the central figure from a man to a woman totally changes the meaning of the image. Um, but the, in, my, in my version, the, the demons seem rather friendly and intimate with the central figure. Um, which I also think is true in Hirschfeld's work that a lot of the demonic or kind of evil figures also seem fairly friendly. Um, why, I can't say for sure. Um, but next. Um, so this is a really fascinating painting, Nude at the Window, 1944. Um, his curtains, form a decorative frame that highlights the naked figure. And yet the contrast between the red and the black makes it almost an abstract painting. Um, it's a very fascinating composition because of the flatness of the, of the figure and then the little shoes that are in front. I'm not sure what the meaning of the little shoes are. And it, maybe it's because he was a shoemaker, but um, I find the curtain very provocative. Um, and very interesting. Um, next. So this is my painting, Nyad, from 2019. And it has a lot of echoes of the Hirschfeld without my having ever seen the Hirschfeld. Um, when I saw the black background in mine and also sort of the um, bird-like female creature. Um, so I'm kind of interested here in creating a dreamlike space uh, and also the sun and the bird and the snake and the flowers, everything uh, forms a decorative frame. And it sort of reminded me very much of the way he frames that figure in nude at the window. Next. Um, this is my painting, St. Martha and the Terra Sec. Um, it's a recent painting of mine that deals with a medieval saint who tamed a monster. And here my monster is also very friendly, I think. <laughs> Maybe it's scary, I don't know, but it doesn't seem that scary. And um, the, the monster is tamed in a decorative, fantastic landscape. So I 
like making these imaginary landscapes, it's based on a medieval about 15, 1600 um, manuscript page. Um, and like the Hirschfeld, I feel the monsters and the animals are sort of in dialogue with the, um, with the figures. Next. So this is um, Girl with Pigeons, which is just an amazing painting. <laughs> Um, I love it because it's so strange, the way the woman is lying down, it seems like she must have been painted standing up, and then the couch was added and she lay down, but um, I love the way the girl has a relationship with the bird, and it's a very mysterious relationship, and we don't know if the bird is feeding the girl, or the girl is feeding the bird, um, and I can see why it was very admired by the surrealists. And um, so next, um, so this is a painting of mine, which is based on a painting by Chagall, which is related to paint to prints he made for La Fontaine's fables. And um, so I like the fantasy and irony of the French writer and then the poems, which is what the Chagall based his on, and also the use of classical and popular mythology and also animals who behave like human beings. So I added a few things. I kind of situated the rooster who's in love with the, with the person on top, whether it's a man or a woman is unclear. And um, also the, the embrace, I like the embrace of the rooster and uh, it's echoed by, there's a couple in, the sail, in a rowboat behind them. And then um, coming to the next slide, um, a nude with flowers. Um, I just love this one. I love the way the flowers are very delicately covering all of the um, you know straight you know parts of her body that we would be upset by, you know the two flowers on the breasts and the sort of flowers around her midriff and the birds that are all sort of celebratory and the decorative behind. Um, and I was really taken with this image and I'll show you my image, which is next. Um, so this is my imaginary garden, which um, I'm really feel like it echoes a lot of um, Hirschfeld's birds and his, and even his trees with the strange flowers um, here I have uh, a, a poet lying uh, on the ground under a very imaginary garden, um, and I and I, I identify with his um, his imaginary gardens, which are really a way of getting out of the grayness of Brooklyn. <laughs> also, anyway, that was my theory of it. Um, so I really I really love the way he handles flowers and women. Um, in his work. And finally, next. Um, so this one is very fascinating. I like when he has these doubles, um, girl in the mirror, but it appears to be two girls rather than a mirrored girl. And then also I love the way he frames these nudes in the blackness and also the detail of the plant that is place so you hide the private parts of the rear end of the lady on the left. Um, and I, I find this modesty very appealing in his work. Um, it's kind of like, I'm gonna do a nude, but don't worry, you know, <laughs> it's not gonna offend anybody. <laughs> um, so next, um, and this is my painting duet from 2020. Um, and it's based on a Romanesque panel I saw in Barcelona. And here I also emphasize the kind of duality of the figures. Um, I'm interested in stylizing the figures and decorating them in a flat style, but also, you know, so that they are framed and which is something I appreciate in his work and I see it in my work. So um, for all those reasons, I'm very fascinated by this artist. So thank you. Thank you so much, Susan.
And so next we're going to hear from sculptor Kathy Rutenberg. She is a sculptor who lives in upstate New York, uh, who creates ceramic constructions of a very magical world, a very surreal place, kind of in the realm of fairy tales. Uh, her female figures often merge with nature, often creating chimeras with animals and plants. And these sculptures often also explore uh, misogynistic violence that are un due un um, onto women's bodies as well. Um, so take it away, Kathy. Um, well, thank you very much. And um, I'm honored to have received this invitation to discuss Marsh Herfield body of work through my eye as a contemporary artist. Um, I thought the best way to begin to prepare for this presentation was to look for similarities in the work and that we both are figurative artists and are often depicting women as well as women with animals. The metaphor life's woven fa fabric seems applicable in regards to both my and Hirschfield's work. I'm a multimedia sculptor and painting, painter working primarily in ceramics, living in upstate New York. My work veers towards magical realism, which historically might have been considered surrealist. There's always a fable hidden somewhere in my pieces. I'm starting my slideshow uh, presentation with two slides of my earlier work to help visualize this transition of focus from painting to ceramic as I left New York City and moved upstate 25 years ago. With this move, my subject matter transitioned as well, so did my medium. The physical experience of working with clay seems to have brought me down to earth literally and physically. My frustration with painting challenged me to create more potent surfaces and the ceramic medium certainly satisfied this challenge. Um, Hirschfeld, uh, Hirschfeld accomplished a vital textured surface with even his first two paintings, an incredible feat for a self-taught artist. Next, please. Besides reading the essay that accompanies The Master of Two Left Feet and the Roberta Smith's wonderful review in the New York Times, I listened to the YouTube program, Rediscovering Morris Hirschfield with Richard Meyer, Susan Davidson, and Valerie Rousseau's fascinating informative discussion. I turned into the question of how to categorize Morris Hirschfield's work. As I started working in ceramics after years of painting, there was the question of the value of my work in this medium, as then the ceramic medium was considered craft. I understand there was some confusion regarding what to consider Morris Hirschfield's painting. He was part of the Dynamic International Surrealist Exhibition, given a retrospective at MoMA, was a self-taught artist whose genre is now considered outsider art and currently showing in a folk museum. I found myself part of the new wave movement in the 80s where expressive narrative work was heralded Again, currently I find myself in another dynamic movement, a figurative ceramic sculpture that is being exhibited in fine art galleries globally. Next, please. The, the connecting thread between my world and Hirschfield weaves in and out of relative substance. I could relate to Roberta Smith's review in, in that it might take a plunge to enter Hirschfield's work and sensibility, but once I spent some time looking I was able to pass the barrier, barrier of the naivety of style and appreciate that I, what I was looking at. The issue I find entering the work deeply is also clearly highlighted by Roberta Smith in the same review where she writes, Hirschfield's paintings themselves seem eternally alert with an absolute stillness and absence of narrative that seem notably modern. Next, please. I find as an animal lover, a mutual sensitivity in this touching this depiction of the relationship of his female characters with their pets. This Angora cat on the woman's lap looks like a sweet domestic tiger to me. The chair comes to life with the faces on the armrest and the wonderful pattern of the fabrics. Next, please. Um, I create figures as platform to tell my story, each detail revealing another fragment of the fairy tale. Figures gulping an iguana or ex exhaling a forest are all symbolic of my connection to the contemplation of wildlife dwelling in wild worlds. In this sensitive epoch of the Anthropocene, the, the well of subject matter is quite deep and profoundly urgent. In the detail of Girl with Pigeons, you can see the tongue-like shape protruding from the girl's mouth. Is she licking the pigeon? Does the shape suggest she is cooing to the bird? Why does, the bird, why does the girl look so surprised? Why is the pigeon horizontal? T 
To me, the mystery compounded with the beautifully rendered designs create a dramatic narrative. Uh, referring again to the YouTube recording, Rediscovering Morris Hirschfield, Richard Meyer discusses the mysteriousness of the work and suggests this was the attraction of the surrealist to his work. Six, please. I mean, X, please. Um, oddly, his naked women seemed to me to present innocence. I know there was some discussion of his female naked figures evoking eroticism, but that was not apparent to me. Next, please. The small hands and feet of his characters is a stylization I too use. Not sure if his representation was, not sure if, his, if this was intentional, but to a similar effect, my intent with this manipulation of doll-like proportion is a vehicle to, to express a feminist question about stereotyping what is considered attractive and female. Next, please. My characters too are, as are Hirschfield's, often are ageless. However, my world consists, consists of landscapes that are unsettled and revealing and not tailor-made. Sex and violence are part of my vocabulary as well as burnt and broken women. Next, please. Certainly, certainly the two left feet is a peculiarity we both share in our work. I always <laughs> place women in high heels as my figures rarely show their feet. And the left and right side is often indistinguishable, which very much aligns to Morris Hirschfield's figures. I did read the stance of his figures might reference the highly stylized poses from ancient Egyptian art. In my quest to pull from contemporary references of stereotyping, high-heeled shoes are certainly a sign of femininity. femininity. Bare feet on a character in my work to me feels feral. I would only sculpt a barefoot figure if it is part of the narrative. I frankly had not given much thought to this quirk in my sculpting of feet, prior to my focus on Hirschfield's characters, but feel it works as it, as it adds to the frail and immobility of a woman character handicapped by beautiful, uncomfortable shoes. Next, please. The story of Hirschfield's life in Master of Two Left Feet is fascinating and reveals so much about the style of his work and how he has woven a vision from his life's experience as a tailor and shoemaker. I certainly can relate to life's experiences shaping an artist's vision. Next, please. The phrase fabric, fabric of life seems appropriate to reference how the work aligns and is where I think Hirschfield's painting and my sculpture have the clearest intersection. Early in my ceramic work, I was creating fabric designs on my ceramic figures. All the clothed figures in Hirschfield's paintings are also adorned with pattern designs. I really feel this graphic feature creates an animated sensation that contributes to fabricating curious stories in these Hirschfield paintings. It is interesting to compare to my process to Morris, to Morris Hirschfield's in this aspect as I never, um, sorry, uh, thought of myself weaving the fabric, but this certainly makes sense as to the direction my work evolved. Next, please. At a certain point, the pattern designs developed into another level. I began integrating my stories onto the dresses to add another layer of complexity to my narratives. Hirschfield doesn't seem to welcome chaos in his world of tightly knit order and control of design. Each stroke, like Stitch, weaves the story without much more revealed. For me, as much as I could pull apart and reinsert into the narrative of the surface was an exciting new direction offered with a ceramic medium. Next, please. The depths of possibility seem endless as I explore and excavate with my work, including inserting sexually dynamic scenes into the intestinal cavity of dresses of characters. But in, in that both Hirschfield and myself carefully have woven a landscape of the mind, I've thoroughly enjoyed contemplating how his work can be compared to mine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you. Next, we're gonna hear from uh, painter Jamea Edwards, Richmond Edwards, uh, who was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, so she used, also uses myth in her works, which tell stories that collapse space and time. 
She also has a background in fashion and often weaves fabric into her paintings as well, um, which play with dizzying and glorious arrays of patterns and textiles that offer parables of the present and future. Um, and so please, uh, Jamea, if you can, uh, yes, take it away and tell us uh, more about your work. Thank you guys for inviting me. And um, it's been really great listening to everyone describe their work. So as Isabel said, I'm from Detroit, born and raised. And as we began to look at my works, um, I want you guys to keep in mind, I was born in the 80s and came of age in the 90s. So think about in terms of the color, the movement, think of Yo! MTV raps, um, um, all of the, 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 the pop culture, the hip hop videos, prints, all of these things kind of um, influence um, my work. So let's move on to the, to the next slide. So looking at these pieces, as I began examining Hirschfield's work, the question for me is who are these women? <laughs> and, you know, as I'm viewing them, I view them as one, mysterious women, um, women who are in control, women who are in power, and them taking part of some sort of some sacred possible ritual or, and, and what I mean by ritual, it could be everyday rituals um, that women, you know, we, we, we do. So just looking at his work and particularly the piece with Girl with Dog is what's really drawn me in is the movement of the sky, the various textures, um, um, understanding his textile background, that is also has significantly inspired me as well. You can move on to the next slide. So the piece to the left is called Archetype of a Five Star. Um, when I was in high school, I was, I thought I was going to be a fashion designer. And one of the things that I did as a teenager was I designed the girls' um, prom dresses. So I would design them. One of the big things in Detroit, which is you find it across the country is prom is our understanding of like, we get to have our dress made. So, you know, girls who can draw, they sought me out to, to begin to actualize their ideas. So as I'm, um, you know, becoming, coming to my, my artistry, um, it's becoming very glaring how much of an influence um, that background of fashion has come for me. So this piece is called Archetype of a Five Star and Girls Standing with Alligator Bags. So on the left is inspired by a rap song by the rapper Trina. She's a Miami rapper, rapper and she had a song um, back in the 90s called um, Five Star Chick. And this is me kind of envisioning what, what does a five-star chick look like, right? Um, so um, me placing, um, these pieces aren't necessarily me or the figures aren't me, but they're iterations or manifest manifestations of me to some degree. And, you know, they possess such sass and knowing. And I always look at my figures as being like really dangerous women, which I can, I, I can sense that in Hirschfield's work, which is why I'm really drawn to it. Um, the piece on the right is called Girl Standing with Alligator Bag. And this was inspired by um, boosting culture in Detroit. I mean, it's really everywhere. And so those of you who aren't familiar, a booster is someone who either sells knockoffs um, of neighboring clothing or they sell. So um, growing up, you know, you have boosters, you know, you have a district in Detroit where, you know, I mean, excuse me, in New York, you can buy a knockoff Gucci bag. So these, this piece, which was part of a larger exhibition, was an ode to that culture of just trying to stay fly, trying to be in the latest, you know, most beautiful um, fashion or, or, or trends of that particular time. Um, next slide. So looking at this piece of Detail of Beach Girl um, is I'm really drawn to the various textures and the meticulousness of his hand. Like it's, it's very, is, is very present. Um, again, looking at this woman is like, what does she know? And how I view his work is I see it as a force field happening in the background. Like it's a whole lot of magic. <laughs> 
that I don't know if we're talking about. And me, I'm just like, this woman is like, I don't know, she is a sorcerer or something. And even looking at the hat, um, it is very um, reminiscent of a halo, right? Um, so we can move to the next slide. So these pieces are from my newest body of work, which are showing in New York right now. And the piece on the left is called Resurrection of the Dead. And um, like Hirschfeld, I'm really looking at texture, really pushing texture um, alongside, I'm, I'm really intrigued by the serpent. Um, and my serpent um, fascination came, became, um, it, it was introduced, to, it was introduced about what, 12 years ago when I was um, studying my MFA at Howard University. And I was really intrigued by Medusa but more so Medusa as an archetype, as this ugly mother. So keep in mind, I'm from Detroit, born in the 80s, in the early 80s. This is around the time of the crack epidemic, the AIDS epidemic. It was really harsh back then, right? So what's interesting is I had family members who were really affected by drugs. And on one end, they would be looked at as an archetype, like the ugly mother archetype of a Medusa, but what was really dichotomous for me was, although these family members and people in my community were on drugs, I still viewed them as the goddesses. And um, I still saw them in a completely different light. And so over the years, I've really been um, really fascinated with the serpent. And so this is the first time that I'm literally sewing this um, fabric, um, this textile onto the painting and this is called resurrection of the dead which is me in conversation with this mysterious ancient past of minds right the piece to the right uh there's there's four figures on horses and this piece is called holy wars and just like Hirschfeld I'm I'm utilizing um animals and in this particular painting which um you can probably find them online or hopefully there's a copy of this you will see that the girls are actually riding uniforms. So I'm really interested in that, that space between like reality and mythos, right? Um, and I'm just like, yeah, let's ride it out. Um, next slide. So um, nude on sofa with three pussies. So again, you know, my question is like, who are these badass women in these spaces? Um, and with their relationship to the animals really, to me, brings to mind like the divine feminine, right? Um, and that's a space that I'm also very intrigued with is this, this concept of divine feminine and um, looking to the piece, um, to the left girl with Angora cats is really this beautiful abstraction above her head. These are the areas that like I really zone, I zone into. Um, because as, you know, I, that's what I see is even looking at everyone's beautiful face on this screen above, I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the energy fields that are literally around us. And so I feel like he's, he's playing with the, the unseen, how powerful the unseen is. Um, next slide. So this piece is by um, Della Wells, if they appear in my house, um, Matisse. And Della Wells, who was a Milwaukee-based artist, is, is my mentor. She was one of my mentors. So although I have, you know, a, a formal training since I was about eight years old, um, when I graduated um, from undergrad, I was an art major in undergrad, and I moved to the city of Milwaukee. I was part of a art organization called Black Artists of DC. And within these, um, excuse me, not DC, it was, um, it was called a BAYA. Sorry, I was a part of another group in DC, but the group in Milwaukee was called a BAYA. I can't remember what the acronym stood for, but these were mostly self-taught artists. And Della was the founder of this um, organization. And I was just so fascinated by, you know, her, her sense of rhythm within her work, her sense of texture. And it just really taught me how to quote unquote break rules after, you know, going through formal education, um, you know, most of my life. I'm just like, oh, wait a minute. Um, and looking at Della's space and even Hirschfeld's space is um, 
you can, it's okay to break the rules, right? And the question is, what are rules and who makes these art rules? Um, we can move on to the next slide. Um, this piece is called Girl in Bedroom Space. Within my work, um, you I, there's orbs, there's these circles that you will find within my work. And what's really fascinating about the orbs, um, they're actually inspired with my, my personal and my family's um, relationship to UFOs. Like we've had these interactions with flying orbs. And um, right before I did this work, my mom had had like an encounter and she was telling me about it. And like shortly thereafter, I had this encounter. And when I say encounter, um, these are, my family has not, since I was a little girl, I would hear of these really mysterious encounters, right? Um, that's really, that like, you can't really explain it. And so on one end, my work is like, oh, it's mythos, it's mythology. But on the other hand, it's like, no, this is real life, okay? Um, and so how I view these orbs are, you know, there's, it's not anything that's like too unconventional. You find them throughout art, you find orbs throughout art history. And one perspective of orbs is that they're guardian angels. Um, you know, it's, it's many explanations, but for me, that's what I view them as. And around this time, when I did this, this is me kind of like, okay, Jamia, you don't have to be spooked out by them. So this is me welcome, welcoming my angels or my protection within like one of my sacred spaces. Um, next slide. Um, so inseparable friends and girl and mirror. So what's really fascinating about these pieces is the sense of duality. And what I'm when I'm thinking of duality, I'm just thinking of the duality of of man, right? Um, the double. What does this double represent? Um, which speaks on to like, okay, yeah, there's there's levels to this, right? And um, you know, on the left, the inseparable friends, it's as if she's pulling her somewhere or she's pulling her back, but is this another portal or is this another world? Uh, that's, how, that's how my imagination go, right? Um, let's move on to the next slide. So within my works, I'm dealing with this sense of duality. Um, and, I'm, and one of the things about my work, I can't really fully explain it yet. I'm still learning. I feel like my work is far more intelligent than I am. And my goal is to catch up to my work. Um, but um, the piece on the right is called In Search of Mu. And Mu is this lost continent, right? If you look up Mu, that doesn't exist. It's very similar to Atlantis. And um, this is really me. And this is work created post-Rona, post-2020, post um, which I felt like I was losing my mind. And um, just with everything that was going on in the world, which really forced me to kind of go within. And so um, I viewed Mu as very allegorical to myself. Like, who am I? What am I? What is my purpose here? And this piece um, to the right really symbolizes me um, finding myself, right? And I, I'm holding this obsidian sword. I'm on this battleground of trying to fight the world, but truly the true fight is within. Um, where the spooks dwell um, on the left. So I'm very much so interested in textile. Um, I'm, my mom is from, you know, she was born in, in the late 40s, but she came up in, during Motown, the Motown era. So when I think of my work in terms of the fringe, the glitz and glam, the glitter, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a very Motown Detroit, right? Um, so this piece where the spooks dwell is, again, this is me beginning to kind of like go within, kind of unpack myself, this sort of existential crisis that's happening and I'm using, utilizing the work to, to explore. Um, next slide. Um, this piece titled No Games Played, and this is, again, me in, you know, post-Rona, um, just kind of like what's going on in the world. Um, this piece is inspired by growing up and watching my family and my, my family members and my mom would invite friends over and they would play a card game called Spades. They also played a um, card game called Blackjack, right? And I remember observing like they were really invested in these games. And 
when you, um, as I began to like really research the history of these card games, it's rooted in um, cardology and divination. So this is me beginning to, um, you know, envision myself. I'm, I'm playing cards with myself, although I have different avatars. Um, but I'm, it's essentially all, all me just trying to figure out this life, this move as the world is literally imploding in itself. Um, and I incorporated the rabbits to really symbolize this, this new beginning that's happening, you know, that I feel that I'm very optimistic about in the world. But beyond the world, this is about the, a new beginning um, for myself. Um, next slide. Um, this piece is titled um, Holy World, excuse me, Holy Wars. And this is currently up. And this is the piece I was telling you about with, um, these are horses wearing unicorn masks. And these girls are, you know, my crew, we're, we're fighting, I don't know what. Um, but it really feels like, you know, it's really how I feel now in the world with everything that's going on because I'm such an empath. I'm like, I feel attacked, <laughs> you know, anytime that I'm logging on social media is just like, it's so much chaos in the world. But if you notice me, I'm a central figure. Um, I'm like really chill, you know, um, <laughs> I'm really relaxed. In the far right of the corner, there's an erupting volcano, which just kind of symbolizes the world, just kind of like in this really funky place. But um, part of my meditation is it's like, it's okay. We, we've survived, you know, my ancestors have survived worse, so we're going to be okay. Um, next slide. Um, bathing beauties. So even just, just looking at his work and um, I can only imagine like in a in the forties, in terms of like how how provocative his work is, just in terms of breaking up the convention of like art, how art is presented, and um, again looking at the textures, and even on the piece to the piece on the right with these angels. Um, this is the this is the work that I really identify with. I identify with the gods and the ghouls, and um, you know, this, this, this woman, she's coming out of the curtain, like, who is she? You know, she's about to take center stage, which, um, you know, I, I really appreciate. Um, next slide. You know, like Hirschfeld, this piece is a framing piece. These are, you know, um, two women, this sense of duality um, on this Palaquin, and this piece is called The Great Return. And, you know, I'll, I'll stop right there. Thank you. How about thank, it you so much. thank you, Jamia. Uh, thank you so much to all of the artists. Um, you are all so amazing and have such wonderful um, and of such a, a variety of different ways to show women um, in such a in so many different beautiful ways. And so, what we wanted to do was talk a little bit about um, you know we can focus in on this painting, especially by by Morris, which is the artist and his models because um, each one of you I think have a, has a really interesting perspective on how he painted naked women, how he painted the nude women. Because um, again, what's so interesting is that we have um, so many artists, uh, male artists in art history painting naked women, but there's something very unique about these ones in particular. And so I would love to hear from y'all a little bit more about you know, what is it that you find, you know, people, you know, what is it that you find maybe is more erotic or less erotic about these pieces? Do you think there's something about them because I'm hearing from you that there's something about them that you don't necessarily find objectifying and yet they're so on display, they're so in the open. Um, so please uh, tell us a little bit more about, um, about what you see in, you know, in this painting as well. Yeah, Susan, go ahead. Well, I mean, I just find it fascinating the way he makes himself really small, you know, in relation to the woman. He puts the woman sort of on a pedestal. And I like the way he's holding up this kind of palette with the, everything's in order, <laughs> like the colors were in, in orders. There's, there's something very touching about it. It's like he's showing that he's kind of this scribe almost like he's not um in charge 
he's he's next to the nude and the nude is kind of very very carefully undraping herself for him and i find that's almost a fantasy thing because combined with the strange cat and butterfly that is behind him um the picture of the cat and the butterfly and you kind of wonder what's the relation between the cat and the butterfly and what's the relation between the man and the nude and the colors that are you know everything everything kind of makes sense and doesn't make sense you know and, the, and then there's the strange rug you know <laughs> that like it's it's you know what, what the use of fabric which a lot of us talked about is also very striking here um so and he's wearing a bath what looks like a bathrobe but i guess it's a apron or something um i wonder what other people think about it um, for me, I, I, these pieces are a bit erotic for me. <laughs> um, so the piece on the right, the artist and his models um, with the paintbrush extended to the model's mouth, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's very, it's very sexualized for me. And even looking at the extension of her dress is very serpentine. It has a very serpentine um, feel to it looking at the piece on the left and this is also kind of speaks to my mind um I see the phallus in it <laughs> and I see the phallus even from the robe how it's tied in and even her holding this rod and just as um you know as as, as was just stated that to me there seems he is placing the woman on a pedestal but to me there seems like a sense of like reverence and also possibly intimidation there's this space um, between the woman and him so i'm really intrigued by his relationship um you know relationship to women how you know what was his relationship to women in his life um and even looking at the piece on the right there's this this large black palette you know this this separating him from this this woman and he has this very extended brush so um you know i that's 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 what i see um go ahead Kathy. Where, where her vagina should be it's an empty space which i think there's no pubic hair there's no some of the pieces you could see a little vagina but on this piece it's it's missing which mm -hmm. i think is really bizarre and it just to me it just evokes such innocence and and he is such a sweetheart holding up this palette. And it's almost like it's a mirror to her back end. But the, the, the clearest thing to me besides the two left feet is just an empty space where, where the vagina should be. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting too, because he's probably, he, it's, it's likely that he's painting this from a mannequin which kind of speaks to what I think, you know, you all have very, at these, you know, different readings, but something that I think kind of connects them is the, the mannequin that sort of something that some, pe some people will read as very erotic. Some people will read as very statue, very, um, very still and, you know, very, and kind of innocent where people, you know, often those things are, are kind of covered up. Um, and so speaking of that kind of sculptural aspect, one thing that um, I really enjoy, uh, I, I really encourage people to go and see the show, especially for this, where you can see where the noses stand out from the painting. And he's built up all of the, um, a lot of pigment, you know, with, with the noses standing out. And then also sometimes the nipples will stand out or different parts of, of the painting. Um, and so one thing we were, we wanted to touch on a little bit is, how that that kind of interacts with his production of an object how the women here are objects or how they are perhaps interacting with objects and i can't help but notice also that that um you know how does that also interact with these women potentially as jewish women also with uh with noses you know with the large noses as well um and is that a kind of could that could be a comment on um on a stereotype or something like that so i would love to hear um from the artists um what you think here and how the women are kind of you know blending or not blending with ornament as well um 
Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm actually confused by, by the news. I mean, it just seemed a little bizarre when you see the paintings up close and you see that he's put this little bit of, you know, <laughs> extra extra flesh or whatever you know on the nose i i wasn't sure what the meaning was it was of it actually and um i don't know if it has anything to do with judaism per se or is it just some sort of weird um affectation that like struck him like that day like oh wow i think these noses need to be bigger you know it just it was you know, there's certain unexplained, one, one thing that I really love about his work and about a lot of outsider slash naive work is there's unexplained things that go on, um, you know, in a lot of the work and you have to kind of assume it's a worldview mm -hmm. that the artist had that mm -hmm. you as a current person may not understand. You know, so I think I, I, sometimes I just view it as a decorative flourish. Mm. I don't know what the meaning of the nose is, is any, but I'm willing to hear from my fellow artists. Well, so, sometimes with the oil paint, when you keep painting over and over, you build that up and maybe he was struggling to create a nose and not want to scrape it away. Mm. But I love the tailor-made girl. I just felt like the, the bouquet or the plants that she was holding just almost came became a brooch on on the front of her jacket, and I just thought it was such a good looking painting. And to look at her hair too, when you talk about um, being perhaps um, you know um, from a Jewish culture that because I feel like my hair looks like that, so <laughs> that maybe that's where um, the the curls that he painted come from. Um, I, I, I see it from just a design perspective, seeing that he has a background in design and him just fashioning the paintings and, you know, in various dimensions and textures. Um, because a lot of times that's how I personally work. Like it's not necessarily, um, you know, a, a significant meaning consciously i'm not saying subconsciously which you made up a really good point um isabella but um um i it to me the noses fall in line with how he's treating the hair just for the sakes of just the decorative aspects of it mm -hmm. um and just being a you know work he's already worked in 3d it's just like okay maybe this painting needs some depth and you know the paintings represent the figures you know emerging out of this this 2D plane. So, um, you know, yeah. really interesting. Wow. Yeah. What you, what you just said, just, you know, made me think I hadn't thought of it before, but looking at some of his work as fashion illustrations and as, as designs for dresses, he might want to see, um, because, and I encourage anyone that's interested in his work, you may be interested in historical or and today fashion illustrations, which are often really surreal and do not look like something in real life. Um, and so that's something that actually um, that speaking of kind of of these surreal moments, um, this is what something that you've all um, you've all kind of touched on a little bit is your um, your interaction with myth and with mystery. And this is something that could go with either this painting or this painting, um, because this one also, I think, has the has the image of the woman. I kind of want to um, to direct us here for the moment. Um, the and the as well as the dog, which all of you also have these images of animals as well. Um, and something that I think we're we're picking up on a lot and it's kind of one of the difficulties, uh, but fun parts of looking at Hirschfeld's work is we don't really know what he's thinking. We don't know what the what the ultimate goal is of of the painting. And there's and Jamia, Jamia while what you're pointing out, there, there's a good possibility that he doesn't know um, what what he's what he's looking for in the end. Um, but one thing that's you know also between his work and all of your work is all of is this you know very intense meticulous um, patterning and a beautiful patterning. Can would any of you like to talk about um, about when you are, you know, what that process is like when you're creating the pattern, what is revealed to you in terms of the mythologies that you're interacting with? And what is it about 
um, about what is it about that ornamental practice that you can do that that someone that might not be able to to discover um, when they're when without that kind of very intense meticulous uh, repetitive practice. Um, for me, and this goes back to um, I learned this when I was at Howard with my mentor Al Smith and. He's, I was, I'm a, I draw, right? I'm also a drawer and I cross hatch, very, very meticulous. And one of the things he told me was to really tap into the rhythm of the work. And I'm like, what do you mean by the rhythm? And essentially what he was saying is why you're making these pieces, allow it to be a meditation. When you're making these marks, allow it to um, um, be as like, as a trance. So, cause you know, a lot of times it can become dull and boring, but once I began to um, adapt what he said, when I'm looking at this work, I see music, I see spirit, I'm from Detroit, I see techno, there's a very specific rhythm within the work um, that he's doing. And, I, and actually I see rhythm throughout, throughout the, the, the painting, but particularly these pieces, to me, it just speaks to a, a meditation and um, uh, it's, what's the word? It, um, a votive, um, a votiveness in a work, um, a very specific discipline because not everyone can do this. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm, I'm literally looking at it like, oh yeah, this is some, this is some serious meditation that he's tapping into. I agree with your, um, actually I was going to say something very similar because I feel like when you're doing a pattern, like when I'm creating, even the painting behind me, just the rhythm, you get into a rhythm and that that is kind of a meditation. Um, and I, I think that there is really something, there's something strangely mystical and, and meditative about this work. Mm -hmm. um, even the way the stylization of the strange dog that looks kind of like a horse, and the woman with the breast in the front, you know, but but everything about it has a certain like he's thinking, but he's also kind of experiencing the green, you know, the green in the background is and with the yellow over it is just like a it creates this net, and the net is kind of a dream space. Mm. It kind of reminds me a little of Aboriginal paintings where they create a space out of a pattern. And I think he had, this pattern was something that created, created a space for him where he could put these figures. And um, I find it really fascinating. And also that blue trimming, the trim up above, which is also like, why is it there? But it's there, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it's like, I wanted that, you know, like he just said, I want worse. I want to do this. You know, I, I need that trim up there, um, which I can understand because I sometimes uh, illogically will put something in a painting and people will say, why did you put that in the painting? I just because it just occurred to me it should go there, you know, so um, yeah. I'd like to jump in here because we are getting closer to the ending time, unfortunately, because this conversation is so amazing and I wish we could continue. But uh, I, I wanted to thank you uh, all because I, I came to you all and I approached you with a very difficult task to look uh, through the work of a painter from a century ago almost and, uh, and to look uh, at it from your perspective as an artist, as a woman. And I felt you, you're, you're doing an amazing job and just bringing so many new stories to the work, new, new aspects. So thank you so much for creating this space of meditation. I think this is really a good world. Um, to, to think of and to end on. Um, also, uh, I think it uh, really uh, reflects, you know, this. I, I came also with this very specific task to look at his portraits of women, and you really also change uh, our uh, perspective on the work, thinking uh, beyond the nudity of the work, but looking at them as with, and I to echo also you, uh, Suzanne, as um, really modest, um, you know, um, approach to the female body, but also, as you said, uh, um, uh, Jamia, it's also uh, they also look like divine uh, uh, female figures, and that's really an uh, interesting take on the work. So thank you so much for for this. I I try to bring some questions. Um, there are uh, someone who's asking uh, Jamia um, 
how do you create your faces and your photograph? Uh, are they coming from uh, paintings or, or, or faces, which is also echoes the work of um, Morris Hirschfeld because his first painting was uh, from an existing painting. So would you like to take that question, Jemia, before we sure. Sure. The figures that are grayscaled are the black and white figures, uh, or excuse me, the grayscale figures. I'm doing them arbitrarily. So I'm just doing them um, intuitively. But in my current work where I'm painting and I'm utilizing myself, which is I've only done that the past couple of years, I'm observing from both mirror and photograph. Thank you. Um... And also, uh, someone is asking me uh, if you see, it's, it's also another question for you, Jamia, if you see anything, um, why there are so many Black artists working with collage and textile, and if you have any, any, any response to that, and if also um, Suzanne and Kathy want to answer this question. Um, yeah, I, when you look at the, like the history of mixed media, you can find that in quilting. You will find it in our cooking, like with gumbos, everything just thrown in there. Um, when you listen to our music, particularly um, I'm the 80s, um, just that that concept of sampling, um, building off of this history and kind of or building off of something that, that pre-existed. I find that absolutely within like the pantheon of, of Black art making. So I look, I do view myself as like the continuum and um, the evolution of that, and I'm very much inspired by Romare Beard. And my goal was to say, hey, where can I push collage, you know, in mixed media? So absolutely, there is a thread. And, and collage is something also we relate a little bit. I'm weaving, at least in the work of, uh, of Morris Urshfield. And so, uh, and I thought you all made this connection very strong with the work. Um, I also have another question about this question of male gaze uh, with which we started, and that will be the final question because we we're already at the time of, of the end. But um, this is the idea of um, you know uh, I we, there is definitely a perspective from from a man in the work. So someone was asking, is, can we define male gaze in another way? Is there a male gaze without sexism? So I just wanted maybe to end on that uh, idea, maybe if one of you want to answer that. Um, the male gaze, I mean, I think his gaze is a very peculiar one to him. You know, as far as male gazes go, that's why I kind of talked about how the, the difference between the surrealist, somebody like Max Ernst or Dolly, um, what, how they saw was so different from, from this kind of, person who you could feel that their life is more confined and that they're not a worldly person. And I think that makes their gay, that their gaze is a male. They are not, um, I think a Jewish male of that time was not a particularly powerful figure either to himself or to the world at large, especially in the forties. So I, I, I don't feel that his gaze is really the gaze of a powerful male or a person who feels super entitled. Um, and I think that's the difference between uh, somebody like Morris Hirschfeld and somebody like Max Ernst or Dolly or any of the surrealists that were, who admired his work, but their work was coming from a very worldly, um place and a more informed place um so i feel like that's why i find his gaze particularly appealing actually you know i i feel like there's we even though it's erotic in some ways it's also innocent um in my view i i don't want to speak for the group but would you like to add anything or should I take that as a final uh, final sentence, final note? Um, I just felt like um, after looking so much um, and really getting into the work, I just felt like um, I was touched by his sensitivity and um, and his softness as in his approach to women. Like the painting that you have up, I, I felt was really influenced by cu cubism that the flattening with her breast, both front and back, is how I saw that kind of contorted figure.
Jamia, do you want to add something? Just to no, I, I just I just echo their regards and um and I'm just gonna leave with just the divine aspect. And even when I'm looking at this figure right here, um, she's in a very um, you know, it reminds me of the Sphinx. And it's and that's what I'm what I mean by like the the divine feminine, um, our relationship to like animals and nature. And it just seems that um there's a reverence there, you know. So I'll leave on that. I I agree. Yeah, she looks yeah. like it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you know, thank so you. The conversation was really, really uh, insightful and uh, and echoes so much what the creators, which are Mayer, uh, wrote in the in the book, saying that uh, watching or looking uh, the the painting of Morris Hirschfeld. Uh, rewards attentive looking and I think tonight we really uh, paid so much attention to the work and that was really rewarding so thank you thank you all uh, and so for inviting for accepting this invitation that was a really a strong conversation and and thank you Isa for being such a, a great moderator um, and for your great course, like introduction and also I'd like to thank all the our audience for staying with us and your great questions um, it was uh, great to have you all here, and I hope uh, you will you enjoy the program. Uh, the the exhibition is on view until January 29th, so you have time to see it, uh, and you should definitely go see the paintings uh, with your own eyes, as you could understand tonight. Um, I would like also um, to invite you to look at our website. We have more program coming up. Thank you again, everyone here. It was really great to have you, and thank you, Isa for moderating this conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank no, you, so ladies. <laughs>